Because we believe that human beings need motivation, need inspiration. In good times and in bad times, people can appreciate a word spoken in a timely way. I've been the beneficiary of that kind of word. I recall when I was in high school, a judge came to our school to speak. And he said his topic was never having to say, I wish I had. Never having to say, I wish I had. In essence, what he was saying to us as seventh grade students, when you finish your sojourn here in high school, be able to say that I have so fully taken advantage of my opportunity in school that I do not have to say, I wish I had studied more. I wish I had behaved better. I wish I had. And I took that word to heart. I went on graduation night. I stood there, and my mother and all my family members watched me get award after award and, and recognition after recognition and make my head boy speech as it was. I was able to tell them on that night that as far as my participation in high school is concerned, I do not have to say, I wish I had. And so those words of motivation, those words of inspiration helped me. And as I grew up, I also appreciated the ability to do the same thing to other people. So I started out working with young people, some of whom had been through some terrible experiences in life. I'll never forget, I got a call from the hospital one night because I was a youth leader. And they said, Mr. Lang, you know, we have a young man in this hospital who wants to kill himself. Can you come and speak with him? And this was about 12 o'clock midnight. And I went and I listened to him and I listened to this young man and I listened to him and he wanted to kill himself because his girlfriend left him. Now, for some of us, that might not seem a very good reason, but it was his reason. We spoke, and I didn't speak with him very long, but I uttered some words to him. And I'm happy to say that that young man remains alive today and doing extremely well. A word spoken in a timely way can be awfully motivational to people. And we need motivation, even when we're doing well, to stay doing well. We need motivation. And that's why I don't undermine, I don't underestimate, I don't take for granted the capacity of each of us to be able to deliver to someone else a word that can make the difference between life and death and success and failing in that person's life. And so this is what these evenings are about, empowering people through motivation. And so I'm happy that you and I can participate in this uh, session in that way tonight. As a cabinet minister in the Bahamas responsible for the financial affairs of the Bahamas, I had a front row seat to the great global economic recession, the worst economic situation that the world had seen in almost 80 years, since the Great Depression. And that front row seat allowed me to see, up front, the enormous challenges that people faced as a consequence of that enormous economic fallout. I mean, I was able to talk to people who had literally lost everything, materially speaking. People whose jobs had been lost, whose income had been significantly reduced, whose mortgages and rents had been backed up, whose ability to pay school fees or whose ability to even buy food was, became impossible. And I looked on the faces of those mothers and those fathers and those children, and I saw just how enormously troubled their lives had become. But I also saw in that same economic circumstance, people who were not having the same economic difficulty, 
but whose quality of life was as significantly affected as those people were. They had other things impacting upon their lives. And they were, sh they were sharing in a common struggle in that environment. And in this country, in the United States of America, there is a new reality facing millions of people. I call it the, the, the democracy of struggle, the democracy, the democratization of hardship. You have people in America now who are unemployed, therefore have no income. You have people in America, millions of people in America who are underemployed and therefore do not have enough income. But you have millions of people in America who are fully employed but who are so heavily indebted they feel like they are unemployed because the difficulty of being able to meet their obligation makes them feel almost as impoverished as people who have no income uh, at all. And many of these people, for the first time in their lives, face a situation that they did not face before. When we had difficult times before, we had the ability to go to some bank or some financial institution and borrow our way through hard times. Remember that? You know, yeah, you could just say, well, you know, I know things are a little difficult now, but I can borrow a couple of dollars, it'll carry me through because, you know, I, things will turn around and will turn around quickly enough and I'll be back on my feet and I can get back where I wanted to, want to be. It's not happening anymore because now the buzzword is deleveraging for personal souls, trying to get your, the debt down so much so that you are able to borrow again. And so many of these people don't have the cover of increased borrowing. And so they are faced with these economic challenges, faced with these difficulties, and, and do not know where to turn. And they're asking themselves, what do I do? I believe that this recent economic fallout exposed a frailty and a folly in the life that far too many of us have been living. And that frailty and that folly is that we've been living our lives subject, subjected to what I call the vicissitudes of life. Isn't that a wonderful word? Vicissitudes. Generally, if you look up the definition of vicissitudes, it might say something like the changes, the alterations that life has. I just call it the happenings of life. Things happen in this world that you and I have nothing to do with, that you and I have no control over. And these things in the course of their happenings can impact upon our life situations. But the problem is that as these things happen, far too many of us, our own quality of life ebbs and flows with them so that in the good times, we feel good. You know, my bank account is full today, and so I feel good about myself. My bank account is not so full today, so I don't feel as good about myself. The economy is booming, so I, I feel good about myself. And then the economy goes down, and I don't feel so good about myself. The reality is, things change in this world. Things happen in this world. And there has to be a capacity on our part to be able to live a quality of life that is not so victimized by these changes. That I'd like to be able to wake up in the morning and know, yes, things have changed. Yes, people have changed on me. Yes, and circumstances have changed on me. But in terms of my core sense about myself, in terms of my outlook and perspective on, in this world, I am not changing with those so that I want to learn, I want to know how to be good, be better in good and bad times. Does anybody have an interest in that at all so that we don't continue on this road with anybody at all? That I'd like to be able to have a level of stability in my life that is not so subjected by the winds of change of this world so that people could see me when I'm doing very well and when I'm not doing so very well. 
with a certain disposition that says to them, you know, they have something that I would like to have. And there is a power to do that. There is a power to be better in good and bad times. The reason why this is so important is because when we find ourselves so subject to the vicissitudes of life, to the changes, the alterations of life, it affects us first of all in terms of our experience as human beings and then it affects the people we live with, we work with. I don't know about you, but I don't, uh, you know, as a husband, I don't want to uh, wake up every morning and have to gauge my wife's treatment of me based on what the economy is doing. <laughs> that could be very difficult. I don't want to base, I don't want her to base my treatment of her on how our business is doing. I don't want my children to look at me and wonder, okay, now, how is daddy going to be today? Maybe I should check the stock market. That can't be the way we want to live. That my boyfriend or my girlfriend treats me one way when things are this way and treats me another way. There is a way to find greater stability. I watched the unfoldings of the occupation of Wall Street. You remember that? And I remembered thinking to myself that the people who were pushing the occupation of Wall Street movement did have a sense that something was going wrong. There's no question about that. But I thought that they were looking in the wrong place. I don't think Wall Street needed to be occupied. I, need, I think we needed to occupy ourselves to some degree. Because in the end, as far as I'm aware, I mean, in America it might be a little different, but in the Bahamas, you really only sign lending contracts with adults. True? Right? Like if you enter into a financial contract, it has to be with somebody who's reached the age of majority, right? So adults entered into these arrangements. And so therefore, if we entered into arrangements with people that may have been to our disadvantage, the assumption is that we did so with open eyes and open minds, and that Wall Street really didn't do anything to us, that we participated in doing something to ourselves. And so maybe if we looked at ourselves more carefully, what we did would affect Wall Street because Wall Street, Wall Street would know we were behaving differently. And so, so it is that people, we, can find this power to be better in good and bad times. And what is that power, what is that power exactly? A number of you are from the Caribbean. And so I believe you are aware that if you're a Caribbean politician, if you go into politics and you're not a wealthy person, when you come out of politics, if you're not crooked, you're going to come out not a wealthy person. If you, if you go into politics in, in the Caribbean, I can't speak for America because I don't know your system as well. But if you go into politics in the Bahamas, in many countries in the Caribbean, and you're not wealthy, and you come out wealthy, your citizens should ask themselves, what did you do? Because generally, you are, as a cabinet minister, as I was, required to have just a single income from your work as a cabinet minister. And that's not a lot of money. And so, like many politicians, I went into politics. I was the youngest person in the history of the Bahamas who was appointed a cabinet minister. I was 29 years at the time. And so I spent a lot of time in public service. And uh, true to form, I came out of it not a wealthy man and uh, with enormous cash challenges because, you know, in the Caribbean, politicians people expect their politicians to be very personal with them. So you bury their dead, okay? You pay for weddings, and you help people with their lights when they can't pay it, their light bills, and you help people with their mortgages when they can't pay it. And it can be an enormous cost to you. 
And so the great global economic recession that took place didn't only affect the people I was serving, I felt it in my own personal life. And when I came out of office last year, May, I had to, I had to start over again from a financial point of view. Literally start over again. But I started, I went to an island in the Bahamas that had been in recession, has been in recession now for 12 years. How long has America been in recession? It was in recession from 2007, 2008, and 2009 things turned around, so that's been about only about two, three years. I am saying this island has been in recession for 12 years. And so rather than go somewhere else where things were booming, I went back home to this island, to this economically depressed place. And I went in that place, and I started a business consulting firm. I started a property development firm, so I build and sell affordable homes. I started two restaurants. The most recent one was a pancake place called Nays Pancake Place. It's like an IHOP in the Bahamas, a Bahamian version of IHOP. The only difference is IHOP can't give you a waffle. What's a waffle? A guava waffle, a guava stuffed waffle or you can have a guava stuffed pancake, or you can have what we call a Bahama Dream pancake, which is a coconut laced pancake, or you can have like a rum infused syrup on your pancake. Yeah, right there in the Bahamas. <laughs> and a number of other businesses that we started. And people are stunned that I would do that in this economically depressed place, and that actually these things would do well. You know why? Anybody remember the movie Flight? Denzel Washington in that movie, in the midst of that storm, that plane was rocking and was shaking, and the co-pilot was afraid. He was frightened, and he, he looked at Denzel Washington. He said, he said, Captain, what are you doing? And the captain said, you see that crack right there in the storm? He said, yes. He says, I'm trying to find that. I'm trying to get us there in that crack. In every economic storm, there are cracks. In every bad situation, there are cracks. But you have to have the presence of mind to be able to find it. Because if you're afraid, if you're panicked, if you're stressed out, if you're frustrated, if you're anxiety ridden, if you're pessimistic, it'd be very difficult to do so. And I tell you today, as I interact with human beings, I find that there are too many people whose lives are characterized by three things, hustle, hassle, and hype. This is how we're living. Doesn't matter that we're dressed up in fancy suits. Doesn't matter that we drive very sophisticated cars. It doesn't matter that we have the latest equipment. People are on the hustle. What is hustle? By me, by hustle I mean the people are really living to survive. And when you are in survival mode, when you are in hustle mode, you don't even know how to treat other people. Because for you, other people are either an obstacle or a stepping stone. They are hardly people worthy of any dignity. We got a lot of hustlers going on. We got hustle, hustle in the government. We got hustle in business. We even got the charities hustling. And they're supposed to be doing charity. And then people are being hassled because the circumstances of life is just beating them down or weighing down on them or wearing them down. It doesn't matter that some people have lots of money in their pockets. They're still being hassled. They're being hassled by the decision and choices that they made or other people make in their lives. And then the hype. The hype that tells us, man, listen, the more you have, the more you are. The more people know you, the more you are. So put a show on, brother, sister. Look the part. Look the role. So you can hardly see people today honest enough to tell you, say, how you doing? Oh, it's rough. I'm bad. I'm tough. You ask people today, how you doing? And there is a difference. It means that I'm doing my business as an outgrowth of my contentment with myself and connectedness with the things that I'm passionate about and want to do. And I'm not doing it as a desperation to accumulate material abundance so that I can be what I could be before I even get the material abundance.
that I can enjoy living as I do the things that having a life allows me to do. And so before I close out, I want to give you a couple of things, a few things that I'd like to encourage you if you want to pursue this ability to be better no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. Is that okay? First thing, and these are things that we have to practice. We have to ha habituate in our lives. There's nothing more powerful, powerful than a habit. If you don't believe me, ask somebody with one. And you have them. Whether you're a coffee drinker, try break that habit. If you're a Coca-Cola drinker like my wife, try break that habit. It's only been about 100 <laughs> times, eh? She's been trying. <laughs> Habits become part of us, and they are very difficult to break. So if you want results from certain things, practices, you have to habituate them in your life. Once you habituate them, you get the results. And so you have to practice them. So I don't expect that you try it one day, one afternoon, and then if you don't see the world turn and change on you, then you abandon them and say, Mr. Lyon came to the New York and spoke nonsense. They have to be practiced. They have to be habituated. And they, they have to be practiced long enough for the habit to form. First habit. First habit, valuing the gift of being. Can I say to you tonight that life is the prize? Life is the gift? It amazes me how we chase so many things with the real gift we have as if it's the gift that we need. But life is the prize. Life is the gift that you get to wake up in the morning and breathe and smell and see and look and do and be. That's the gift. I'm sorry, having a big bank account is nice, but it's not the gift. Having a very successful business is wonderful, but it's not the gift. If you don't believe that, try taking that successful business with you once you pass on from this world. Try it. Many have. They bury themselves with it. Can't do it. The one thing you came to this planet with, the one thing that allows you to be miserable or happy on this planet, and the one thing you will leave this planet with is the gift of all gifts, and that is life. And you have to, practicing to value it every day helps you to appreciate that it doesn't matter if things are good or things are bad, I am all right. That if they bring me down to my lowest, lowest, lowest point, if I have life, I can lift myself up. People have done it over and over and over again. Valuing the gift of life. Second thing is practicing presence. This, I have to tell you, is one of the most important teachings I received in my life in the last 20 years. And to it, I owe a great deal of debt to a gentleman by the name, a spiritual teacher by the name of Eckhart Tolle. You and I have an amazing ability, our minds. You know what that ability is? Never to live in the now, always to live in the past or in the future. Some of you sitting right here right now was thinking all, all the while about something you maybe had to do or something you have to do, but hardly being right here right now. We do that, so we, we do that with such ease. The mind, nobody tells the mind to do it, it just does it. It lives in either regret or anticipation. You think about that. This is one of the reasons why we can't even have a genuine conversation with another soul. Because even while they are speaking to us, we are thinking about what we want to say to them. But if you want to really enjoy and fully appreciate life and living, you have to learn to be in the now. Yeah, even if you want to perform well on your job, if you want to excel at a business, if you want to be able to apply yourself fully to solving your problems, the best place to do that is in the now. Because the past 
I put out a challenge to someone. I asked them, if you can give me a good, if you can give me one benefit to regret, I will give you $1,000. I've done this for the last 20 years. Just one benefit to regret. Regret is always about the past. Is there anything anyone in here can do about any single thing that's happened in their past? Anything, anything right now? Cannot. And so if somebody obsesses about the past, what do we call them? If, somebody's, if, if you were a Miss Universe and you are still acting like you are Miss Universe, what do we call you? Sorry. Crazy. <laughs> we say you're insane. She's insane. She thinks she's Miss Universe. That was 10, 15 years ago, ma'am. Because anyone who obsesses about the past is really obsessing about something they can do nothing about. And that, that's insanity. Similarly, obsessing about something in the future, which is not real, is also insanity to a real degree. Because you can't do anything about the future. People always say, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to lose weight tomorrow. No, you're not. When you get to tomorrow and you're losing weight, when, where will you be? In today. No one ever runs fast enough to catch up to tomorrow. It's not possible. Every single meaningful thing that you and I will ever do in our lives, we do in the now. We do in the present moment. This is where the living happens. So practice, learn to keep your mind present. Many of us would not know what was in this room tonight because we weren't present enough to see those pictures on the wall, abstract photos as they are, this dark carpet on the floor. Because we don't live in the world, we live in our minds. And our minds are either in the past or in the future. But try it, practice it, and watch and see how energized and enlivened you become, living in the now. Watch and see how creative, innovative, entrepreneurial you become. Because your being now is so attuned to the nowness that you can zoom in on opportunities that other people may not see because they're too busy floating in the, in the future or floating back to the past. Value the gift of being. Practice presence. Thirdly, practice acceptance. Acceptance. Listen to me. Whatever your reality is, whatever your situation is, it is, it is that. And so typically what happens with us is we do two things when we have situations in our lives, especially negative situations. We take those situations and we keep them so much in front of our faces that we can't see to do anything else. The only thing we can do is see our situations. Or we say, you know what, I'm going to ignore it. So I'm going to hold it out here as far as I can away from my face so that it isn't bothering me at all. The only problem with that is anybody who's ever tried to hold anything up in front of them for a very long time, no, that's very exhausting. Acceptance means I acknowledge what situations exist in my life. I'm gonna, if I can't do anything about it for the time being, I'm gonna put it in my lap so I can free my hands to do the other things I can do something about. And then when I have and can do something about the situation, I'm gonna pick it up again and try. Acceptance, avoiding our problems or situations or keeping them ever in front of us, blinding us to the ability to do anything about anything else is not the way. Acceptance. The fourth thing that we need to do, and I made a significant commitment to doing this in my life, is obliterating worry from my life. Mm -hmm. Nothing diminishes the quality of life of a human being like worrying. Maybe that's why Jesus says, why do you take thought for tomorrow? Thought there meant worrying, anxiety. Why are you anxious about tomorrow? 
And all worry is tied to the future. All worry is tied to the belief that something bad is going to happen to me tomorrow. And our minds latch ourselves on to worry that way. I remember one time, you know, when I was challenged to pay my rent. I had paid the rent when it was due, but, you know, I'm in business, so, and I don't know if I'm going to have it 30 days from now to pay. And I'm laying on my bed worrying about when, what's going to happen in the next 30 days, and then something said to me, said, Shivago, why are you going to take, why are you going to ruin these 30 rent paid days worrying about a rent that is going to be due 30 days from now? And that's what we do. But to obliterate worry from our lives means we have to be able to, to live in the now. To work and maximize this present moment so that it, the results of it, will take care of the other moments to come. Because I promise you, that worrying will work against your ability to make your life better off. That, I can promise you, it will affect your health, it will affect your wellness, it will affect your relationships, it will affect so many things about the quality of your existence. And there's no good or bad time that worry will not ruin. Obliterate worry from your life. One of the ways to do that is rather than Focus your thoughts on, the, on worrying about the problem that you have. Focus those same thoughts on what can I do to make this worry go away. So sometimes in my business, you know, you're challenged because you're thinking, okay, where's the revenue growth going to come from? And then I'm, you know, you're worried about it and you're concerned about it. And I think, you know, why don't you just brother go ahead and do some marketing? <coughs> See if you can get some more customers. Put your energies on that. Go face, go put a post out. Go make a commercial, do something. As opposed to spend my time anxious about something else. Obliterate worry from your life. And then finally, finally, one of the things that I would say you and I need to practice. And Forgive me if it sounds a little corny uh, for the moment. But it is as true, even if it is. I remember thinking about why it was that Bill Gates became such a wealthy man. I mean, he's become excessively wealthy. And I, wondered, and I thought about why he did. And it was because he created this operating system called Windows, right? And if you think about Windows, Windows is a master operating system of a computer that makes every other system in a computer work well. So like all operating systems, if you have a word system, if you have a, a, a data management system, it makes these systems work well. But before Bill Gates created his Windows system, there was the disk operating system. And those of us who remember the disk operating system, it was complicated to use. Because you had to use your function, uh, shift this, and, and control, alt, delete. And you had to remember all these functions. Well, Bill Gates eliminated that for lots of people. Because he created this interactive situation where people could just click and the software would work on the basis of that click. And that was much easier for people to see these pictures, these icons, and then to be able to manipulate the computer. And, and because it became so popular, and it went on so many systems, it made Bill Gates extremely wealthy, at one point the wealthiest man in the world. I said, you know, Lord, <coughs> this was my thought to myself. I said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was an operating system for life, if there was a Windows of life, if there was something about life that made everything else in life work well. Is there, is there a Windows of life? 
is there a master operating system of life? I asked that question. I prayed on that question. Because if, if, there, if there is, wouldn't you want it? Seriously, I'm serious. It, wouldn't you want something that made everything else in your life work well? And I asked, I prayed on that. Now here's the corny part. You know what I was told? I was told there is a windows of life. There is a master operating system of life. And the windows of life, the master operating system of life, is love. That if you and I pass anything that we do through love, it will work the way it's supposed to work. If you pass your communication with other people through love, your communication will work as it ought to work. That if you pass your performance at work through love, that you will perform at work as you ought to perform. That if you pass your business systems through love, there will be ethical conduct, <coughs> there will be productivity, efficiency, and there will be dignity in what you do. And so I say to all of us tonight, it doesn't matter if you're the wealthiest human being on the planet or you're the most impoverished human being on the planet. It doesn't matter if you're the smartest human being on the planet or you're the most ignorant human being on the planet. It doesn't matter if you're the most powerful human being on the planet or the weakest. We have got to end this country, in our countries, in this world, practice love with greater, greater regularity. And it will be, it will inure to the benefit of our own selves first. The lover is always benefited first, always. And then the one loved, equally so. That being good, being better in good and bad times requires this practice. And if we do these things, what happens is that we find that through awareness, through this awareness, this practiced awareness, we come to find a contentment that allows us to be good, to be better, where the times are good or times are bad. And I share these with you, not because they're theories, because they are, but because they have been absolute, absolute benefits in my own practice life. And I trust and hope that that has been helpful to you. God bless you, is my prayer. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to receive them. Let me see. But any questions or comments that you might have, I'd be happy to take. Yes, sir. Well, I wonder if those things already did. Those things already did. Like you said, we don't have to figure it out because the resources are all, all there. We got to work together, innovation, and go towards things like what you're talking about because the, the land was always there. Nothing changed. The resources and everything. Well, you know, being a have obsessed society, if having is an obsession we have, then using resources is an obsession we must do. And then depletion is a reality we must face. And do we not now face it? I th we could, in being, have half the things we have and still be twice as well off as we are. <laughs> true or not true? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. Oh, right, sure. Yes, sir. I resonate to what you're saying. But as I sit here, I begin to think um, there's, a, there's a crunch here. If all things are equal, well, I'm good. But there are, are there, something should be said about different levels of, there are people who are not at the same level of 
reflection or understanding or intuiting these things that you talk about and you're right the, the, you see, and, and, and we, we mix with people. We, we are social beings. Sure. And there's the crunch. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with someone who is not at that level of understanding? I mean, excuse me, people. Uh, have you read the ancient literature and, and what they call the saints? The saints dealt with different levels of spirituality. Sure. Okay. And now, now, what you said, you can't, uh, there's no problems with what you, with, with what you said. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's sound, it's sound. But the crunch is when you begin to meet other people who you feel, you accept yourself, you are you, you know, uh, you, you try to flow it all through love, but you meet people who are not at that same level as you are. Or the other person then communicates mm -hmm. to you. I guess if everybody is at that level, if everybody practiced that, it would be what I'm talking about. That's the about. mission. So, so you, got, you got my point? I do, I do, I do, I do, I do. And it's a very sound point. Okay. But that's the mission. That's the mission. The mission is if I'm enriched and I meet a poor man or a poor woman, then I seek to share what I have so that I can make them richer. So that somebody isn't where I am is a call to teach. That's all there is. It's well, a. Man, it, what you're trying to, what you're trying well, to do for well, in, in, in the well, community. I, I, I will tell you what I, I will tell you what I never trouble myself with. Okay. Never trouble myself with. And I leave you on this note so that we can hear from Miss Bartles in a little while. But I leave you on this note. Anybody know the parable of the sower? Mm -hmm. You know the story of the parable of the sower? How much do you know about the sower? How tall was the sower? What color was he? What did he wear? How educated was he? You don't know anything about the sower other than he was a sower, right? The seed. What kind of seed was it? Was it corn? Was it grape? Was it apple? Was it guava? Does anybody know? You know nothing about the seed. How much do you know about the soil? A lot. Some soil was good, some soil was bad, some soil was this. So you've got a lot of details about the soil, but not a lot of details about the sower or the seed. I wonder why that is. The reason it is, is because if you're a sower, that's what you do. So what do I need to know about you? That's what you do. If you're a teacher, that's what you do. And why do I need to know about a seed? The only thing a seed could do is bring, out, bring after its kind. So I don't really need to know anything about a seed. It does no choice but to bring after its kind. But I do need to know about the soil because it will determine the amount of results I get. And so my job, if I'm a sower, is to sow. I never trouble myself about results because I am not in control of those. So you and I, we meet people who are not where we are, you say, or not at that same understanding or not at that same level, and simply sow and move on. And the universe and its creator will take care of the rest. That is my responsibility. That is why I never go to bed with headaches about results of anything I do at work or business or life. I simply sow and I leave the results to he who is much more competent than I am. Much more. So. And if, if we do that, with the good seeds that are in our hands, our world, in our little space, on a and wide away, will be a better place. God bless you, is my prayer. Um, I took a lot of good notes last night, so um, I'm still inspired and I'm still motivated by what I heard. And so let me say this. I am Sarita Battles, and I am that I am.
So let me tell you why we sponsored this. Um, so, and I'm not one to talk about wells and commercialize it. Um, but what I, what I am going to say is that Wells Fargo is committed. Um, we would not have been able to do anything like this without that level of commitment from an organization that focuses on diversity, um, that focuses on making sure that people are educated, um, especially in the financial um, realm. And as I was thinking about everything last night, I thought to myself, you know, if my manager were to come to me, he would look in this room and say, you know, this is a lot of self-development, this is a lot of self-taught things. Um, you know, what does this have to do with the results? Right? What does this have to do with mortgage? And what I would say to him today is that people bring self to the table when they think about whether or not they're going to buy a house, whether or not they're going to open a checking account, whatever they're going to do from a financial standpoint, they bring self to the table. If self doesn't understand what's going on, if self hasn't been taught about what they need to know, then what happens is the crisis that we just went through. Because people brought self to the table, but self didn't educate themselves enough to know better. And even within the mortgage realm or within the banking industry, it's the same thing. People bring self to work, and people do self stuff. And sometimes they're not educated, and they have other motivations to do particular things. And I think what happened was the perfect storm within the industry. What I'm proud about, and I've worked for Chase, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, all are great companies. What I'm proud about when I work for Wells Fargo is that I don't have to compromise who I am. Right? Wells Fargo allows us to come out and be who we are, but they do expect us to represent the organization in a good fashion. This company has been around for a long time. They do a lot of great work, and we don't hear a lot about that. So this was an opportunity to see um, into something that Bevan had brought to the table and basically said, you know, and I met Bevan one day, I mean, by chance. We met um, at the National Black Journalist Convention. And when I met him, I met Bevan, and Bevan was talking about something that was going on in his life. It wasn't a business conversation or anything like that. And then about three to four months later, Bevan reached out to me and told me about this opportunity. And this is an opportunity where, you know, when Bevan called me, I said, okay, yeah, I, I think I can do this. Just send me what the plan is and I think I can do it. But this is an opportunity where you see something and you don't worry about it. You just see it, you show up, and you allow God to water it. And I think that's exactly what he's done. And so I've been in the session last night in Fort Lauderdale and now part of this session and I'm just really seeing what God truly is doing um, in the lives of everybody that thought it not robbery to show up right and be educated and to learn something and to develop self we were talking last night to a couple of people and um, we were talking about the fact that we don't value our being enough to invest in it we invest in so many other things and I was talking to someone and I, and I said, you know, I had a leadership development coach come to me, African-American woman, very, uh, you know, known throughout the industry. She's been on Oprah, she's been on Larry King, and I didn't know her. And she came up to me and she said, I, I really, I'm inspired by you and I just really want to truly be your coach. And she told me how much it was going to cost. And... I didn't know how big she was. I didn't know much about her. So she said, it's going to cost you, I usually charge $40,000. I'm going to charge you twenty. And I went home to my husband and I said, $20,000? Yeah, I mean, I'm okay. <laughs> I, 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 I've accomplished a lot. And so there's the limit, right? There's the limit. I've accomplished. I think I've arrived a little bit, so I'm okay. $20,000 is a lot of money. But then I thought about my husband wanting a car. And it was okay to go out there and spend thirty thousand dollars for that, and that goes away. I mean, I mean that tears up whatever. We gotta fix it, all those types of things. But me, I don't. I didn't value myself enough to invest twenty thousand dollars in myself so that I can continue to do the things that God would allow me to do. 
I just set a limit on myself. And so, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, being present is awesome. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me close with a couple of things. And this is, I wrote this last night, and I don't know how much you talked about tonight, but I'm going to repeat it because a lot of people were inspired by it, and so was I. Because when I say it and you say it over and over again, you begin to believe it. And what I said to the group last night is that we all have a call on our life because God made us. Number one, however, we have to be in position to answer the call. Be in position, be present to answer the call. We have to put ourselves in position to be still and hear the instructions. We have to be confident and faithful to be obedient to the call. And number four I had down, God does not require us to be qualified. It is he that qualifies the call. So when we think about the fact that God created us, and I am that I am, right? And he created me. He created me to be everything. He had a plan and a purpose for my life. My job is to understand what that plan and purpose is. So I gotta clear my thoughts, I gotta, I gotta clear all of that, I gotta get all that mess out of the way so that I can understand and be still and know what God's call in my life is. And one of the things that I said to the team is, we all have a gift. God created us with that. We all have gifts and talents. And sometimes we struggle trying to determine what that gift and talent is for our lives. And one of the things I said to them is that when your gift aligns with your passion, there lies your purpose. So when your gift aligns with your passion, there lies your purpose. So now the only thing you got to figure out is what is that gift? What is it? And how do you find that out? You got to seek God. Get in that quiet space and really truly see God on what that gift is. Because when we don't use that gift, some people lose it. And when we work on operating that gift, how much more can we attain? How much more can we serve? How much more can we minister? How much more can we bless? That's huge. My job is to make sure that home ownership is possible for minorities across the full economic spectrum. And to make sure that we're lending in low to moderate income communities. I do that for the entire organization with Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. That's a big job because some people don't understand how to, how do I find you? I'm not going to find a lot of you at the first time home buyer seminar that we put together all the time. And so when I think about my community, Caribbean community, African American community, Asian, Hispanic, how do I find folks to be able to talk about what we do? This is an opportunity. That's why I'm here. And it's not to say, I want you, hey, I want you to do this, because really we lead by example. I just want you to think about us when you think about anything dealing with your financial situation. I want you to think about Wells Fargo because I want you to think about the commitment that Wells Fargo had to you tonight and what Wells Fargo will have to you for life. Right? You hold us accountable, and I think we'll be able to serve you, but you got to hold us accountable. And the only way that you can hold this organization accountable or any lender of your choice is you got to be knowledgeable. You got to know what you know. And what you don't know, you got to ask questions. One thing about our community is we don't ask enough questions. We're so afraid of being either turned down. And if you're turned down, you turn down. So what do I need to do? So tell me, if somebody turned me down right now, I'd be like, okay, you turn me down. So what do I need to do in order to get the approval? Then you tell me the five things I need to do. And then what do I go back? I go back and I try to make sure I'm in a position 
to do those five things so that when I come back to you, I can get a yes. That's how that stuff, that's how it needs to operate. That's the stuff that keeps me up at night. I have, I have family members, my mom and my dad, house, about to go on foreclosure. Daughter has been working in the industry for 20 plus years. And they didn't ask me. <laughs> because they were my parents. Right? We should know better. And they didn't come to me until the last minute. But once they came, what they had been worrying about for nine, ten months, almost a year, was solved in two months. The process had begun and all they had to do was ask the question. That's... <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Don't let, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying this, and I, don't let what you hear because it's all on the news, everything. You hear all of this stuff. Define what you think. It's going to take you knowing. Yep. It's going to take you being self-aware. What questions did I ask? If I'm in a situation right now or something happened or whatever the case may be, what did I bring to the table to cause that? Self-awareness is key. And the more we're self-aware, the more we can make things happen. The more we can change, the more we can influence. I mean, that, that's, that's what we need to do. So, with that, let me make sure that I introduce the two people that came with me to, that work for Wells Fargo. Um, the first person is Olin Chamberlain, who is my Divisional Diverse Segments Manager. Olin's counterpart, Rob, Rob Silva, who is actually the Regional Diverse Segments Manager.